Okay. Now you may recall how we did it in the 1D problem and take a uh, take that as a Q. All right. Can you think of how to do it? All right. What we need to do is recall the mapping. Okay. So that mapping was uh, written as follows, right? We said x, right, the position vector of any point in the physical subdomain, right, could be reparameterized in terms of its uh, position on the parent subdomain. And the way we got that parametrization was by using the same basis functions. To, uh, expand, to, to, to interpolate, if you want to use that term, to interpolate the physical coordinates of the nodes where A now follows the local numbering. Okay? This is our map. Okay? Or now using so-called coordinate notation, right? What this lets us write as well Right, what we know is x, sorry, each x little i component, right, can be parameterized by the full c vector, c1, c2, c3, and this is then just some a going from 1 to number of nodes in the element, n a C, X, A, um, for element E, but now component I of the X vector, right? I've done, I've really written the same thing in both the equations, except that in the first case it's direct notation, in the second case it is using coordinate notation, right? And this is this. Okay. From here, just as we did in the 1D problem, we can go ahead and compute um, partial of xi with respect to C capital I, right? Which is just sum over the nodes in the element. Now, Na comma I, capital I, X, A, E, I, right? You note that there is a proliferation of indices here, right? There are superscripts and subscripts all over the place. The subscript for the element E is just coming along for the ride here. It's really not doing much for us right now, okay? All right, so this is how we compute this uh, derivative. Now, uh, of course, this doesn't help us uh, immediately because uh, when, if you recall the, f uh, the form that the chain rule takes as shown here, what we need is actually the inverse of that uh, gradient, right? Because we need the derivative of ci with respect to xi, right? The thing marked with a question mark. All right. So how do we go about that? Okay. In order to do that, what we need to observe is that um, for the mapping that we have here, and I'm, and I'm going to draw it here, we have our physical element, our element in the physical domain, okay, that one, right, and this is element omega e, right, which uh, we've obtained from this nice by unit domain, right? Now we are calling these uh, C1, C2, C3, right? 
And what we've done essentially is to observe that for any point here in that domain, we and given an arbitrary point C in the parent subdomain, we actually have a map, right? Okay, and that map is X of C, right? Now, that is a vector map, okay? In the context of uh, looking at configurations, um, especially if you have a background in continuum mechanics or some other field where you're looking at configurations and their mappings, this is what we call a point-to-point -point map, okay? So this is a point-to-point -point vector map. It's almost superfluous to say vector there because there are, our representation of points here is indeed as vectors, right? We're using position vectors. Okay, so uh, what that tells us is that we can comp compute the, the gradient of that map, okay? The, the gradient of the map Right? which is actually properly in the context of mapping configurations, the gradient of the map is also often called the tangent map. Okay? Okay, the tangent map is uh, what I'm going to denote as a tensor, right? Because uh, X is a vector, C is a vector, we're going to compute the gradient of X with respect to C, uh, that gives us a tensor, okay? So J is uh, this derivative. Okay? This is what sometimes gets called the Jacobian of the map. All right. Now, this is direct notation, right, for this tangent map. We can also adopt coordinate notation, right? So, in coordinate notation, that uh, tangent map is uh, J little i capital I is the derivative of the xi coordinate, x little i, with respect to c capital I, okay? All right? Now, if you've uh, studied continuum mechanics, you will recognize that to be something. Right, that is essentially the deformation gradient from continuum mechanics, okay, from the kinematics of continuum mechanics. Anyhow, we're not going to use that nomenclature, we'll just call it the Jacobian of the map, right, which is what it is mathematically. Okay, um, now again, it's, it's, it's a sort of um, a detail of uh, a formal or, or, or rigorous detail to observe that, well, you can truly represent a tensor only if you have a basis, and if you have a basis, you can then represent tensors as square matrices. Okay, that is actually a carefully constructed argument, but we don't need to go into that argument, right? So we can represent it as a matrix. Okay, right? And truly the fact that we can represent it as a matrix comes from the fact that we have a we have basis vectors in the physical domain as well as in the parent domain, but we, we won't get into that detail. Okay, so, so J is simply, that matrix J is simply this, right?
right and of course there are terms here. Right? And you see this is just writing out uh, what I had on the previous slide using coordinate notation. I'm writing it out explicitly here. Okay? So we have this. Now, why should I bother with this? Because uh, note that um, the map that we have is um, continuous and it is smooth. It is actually what we call a C infinity map. Right? We are able to take an infinite number of derivatives of this map. Okay, so the map uh, x of c from omega c to omega e is c infinity. Okay, All right? We can take so it's actually a very smooth map. If it's a very smooth map and j is uh, partial of x with respect to c, right? <laughs> it turns out that um, rigorously its inverse exists, okay? Okay, so there exists j inverse which is partial of c with respect to x. Okay, that is what j inverse is indeed by definition, all right? But that's easy to do now. We have j in front of us. We can compute that explicitly because we do indeed have an explicit representation for each of those x1, xi's, x little i's with respect to each of the c capital I's, right? And therefore, it's easy to compute j inverse, right? So, the, so j inverse represents a partial of c with respect to x and uh, indeed we have j inverse is the matrix, the matrix representation of it is partial of C1 with respect to X1, partial of C2 with respect, sorry, C1 with respect to X2, Right, all the way to, 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 to this last 3, 3 component. Okay, it's a 3 by 3, so that's not difficult to invert. It can actually be inverted exactly if we care to do that. Okay, and we do indeed care to do that, right? Um, but then you note what we've done. Right? Essentially what we have is uh, J inverse, right? We look at its components, capital I, little i now, okay? It, these components are indeed the terms we need or the factors we need in the application of the chain rule, okay? All right, so the key here is that because of the fact that we are explicitly constructing that map, right, the vector to vector point map, x is a function of c, we can compute the tangent map, it's just a three by three, easy enough to handle, can be explicitly inverted, right, in closed form, and uh, the components of that inverted matrix are indeed the ones that we need for our chain rule. Okay, this is actually an excellent place to stop this segment.